pod smashers of the internet, and welcome to another bonus level episode of Boo 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 80 Bit Pod Smash, where gaming goes to grab a beer. We are your hosts, Penguin and Termite. I am Penguin. I am Termite, and we are usually a weekly video game podcast smashing together ideas that you care about with video games that goes live every Monday at midnight on these podcast services that you're listening on right now. But this is a special bonus episode. It goes live unedited, uncut, immediately after we record, and we're going to talk all about the Xbox Games Showcase in lieu of E3 for 2020. That's right. We did one for PlayStation, and we did one for something else but we did a whole one dedicated just to the how the coronavirus completely screwed everything up for us but uh now we're doing one on uh xbox because we got to talk about the competition for sony and uh yeah let's term i mentioned this is going to be raw and unedited so you're gonna hear all the uhs the ums the awkward jokes that we usually cut out the pauses the stuttering the coughs all of it you get all of it so yep uh yeah apologies if that does not if that's not something that you are interested in listening to and you'd rather have a cleaner crisper episode than stick to our main main episodes weekly episodes uh because this one is going to be a little bit more rambly a little bit less focused but we yeah we just and and possibly long longer (laughs) than normal because uh penguin is not going to whine and complain about having so much to edit during the week so uh, it goes live right away (laughs) and i'm not going to cut it so (laughs) so yeah we usually uh, have a like a tight sanctioned show based on a topic we run through it we have notes we have segments we have things like dlc and we have uh favorite things we're gonna skip all those tonight we're gonna jump right into our topic our main topic of discussion again we just launched an episode yesterday the day before this past monday about caffeine junk food and the gaming industry uh and go listen to that with our our friend of our show ryan he was an awesome guest on the show so go check it out uh and then this next coming monday we're gonna have an episode where we discuss accessibility options. Yeah, that's it. We already talked about that. So that'll come up next. Uh, So that is our normal show without further ado. Let's talk about, let's start the bonus level. Xbox. So, (laughs) <laughs> we watched I was about to this. say something not family friendly <laughs> oh, yes. well, oh yeah we are a family friendly <laughs> podcast we want you guys to be able to listen to it with the kids in the car if you're doing your dishes or you got your clean in the house and you want us on your Google Homes and Amazon Echoes and all of those things uh, we don't want to be a hindrance to anyone who wants to listen to our content so we try to stay family friendly so now, we stifle impulses like the one I just had so <laughs> exactly good job thank you yay so, me alright Xbox let's do it so what we, happened what are we, we discussing? did a live discussion as it was happening uh we did not record it because we were on our phones and it was about an hour long uh run through of what xbox is going to be offering software wise with the uh new console coming at the end of the year the xbox series x launches holiday of 2020 and do you want to go through this thing i don't have the in order list of games i have my list split up differently so Normally, some of these like I, I processing. Think that, I think that we don't have to do it in in order that it was announced because that sounds that sounds like uh, a lot of work. Uh, if you don't have it that way, I think it makes yeah. more sense. I think listeners would appreciate it more if we just talk about it in the list you have because you have it split up. If I'm reading this correctly, you have it split up into third party games that are going to be on um, that either have already been announced or are, are already on multiple platforms or are going to be on multiple platforms. And then there's uh, the actual Xbox exclusives that are going to be on, uh, you know, either windows or they're going to be on like the game pass and will be available on windows or available on, uh, won't be available on PlayStation, but it's basically right. or Nintendo. Well, kind is basically of. What it is. I, almost. You're, you're very close. The top list I have that we'll start with where, and I'll go into why I did this. I ordered, I ordered it this way for a reason. Uh, there, there's a list of exclusives that are going to be kind con- and I call them exclusives in quotes because everything is available on PC as well, uh, is the Xbox right. Series X. That's the newest console. These are the games that are only going to play from an Xbox Series X line of consoles, meaning okay, then let's not start- Xbox One. That's fine. Let's start there yeah. and you can explain why you did that first, like why you yep. arranged it that way first. And it's actually can it's it's good and contextual because this is going to add to our conversation about Microsoft's strategy going into next gen and how they're going to compete against Sony and the the contrast there. So 
I do want to start with back in January of 2020, Matt Booty, who spoke with UK Gaming, uh, a site called MCV, over the next two years, I'm sorry, over the next year, two years, all of our games, sort of like PC, will play up and down that family of devices, Booty said. We want to make sure that if someone invests in an Xbox between now and Series X, that they feel they have made a good investment and that we're committed to them with content, committed to them with content. Fast forward a month into February, Phil Spencer continues to elaborate. We're making the commitment to use smart delivery on all of our exclusive Xbox Game Studios titles, including Halo Infinite, ensuring you only have to purchase a title once in order to play the best available version for whichever Xbox console they choose to play on. And then I am going to quote um, an article that I will, I don't have the reference for uh, because I, it's a short, succinct quote that I agree with to my mind that only leaves three possibilities with the fact that we have a list of Xbox series X exclusives, because the fact that that list exists is in direct conflict with what I just read from what Matt Booty and Phil Spencer said, because they said no exclusives for 18 to 24 months, like a year, two years. Like all of our games are going to work across all of the Xboxes. That includes the original base Xbox One, the Xbox One X, and the Xbox Series X. I hate you, Microsoft, for this naming convention. This is awful. So bad. Ugh. We've we've hit on that before. It's, I know. No need so to beat that three, dead horse. I know. Three possibilities here. Microsoft broke that huge promise in record time. Two, six out of the nine next gen exclusive Microsoft showcased with this showcase won't arrive until two years after launch. That's kind of the camp that Termite sets in. Or three, someone screwed up when making the presentation title cards for each game, yeah. which also kind of happened based on a Kotaku article that we'll talk about. Cool. So, <laughs> no, I'm I'm I am with you on. I lean towards the fact that almost all of these games that were announced as Series X exclusives, meaning that they weren't going to be available on the one. Uh, implies to me none of them had release dates. Some of them were just complete teasers altogether that showed no gameplay or anything. So my guess would be that these are the these are the games that are coming out two two or three years into the launch of the console, which just seems well. And you know, actually, uh, now that I think about it, Hellblade Two was supposedly supposed to be coming out via smart delivery or whatever. So I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, I th- this something. Something's fishy about this, and we there was a lot of confusion that you and I were talking about as we were watching this thing uh, and discussing it together. So um, we'll we'll get into more of that, but let's first start talking about the what's. And uh, unless you had any other any other additional thoughts or quotes that you wanted to pull before we go into what were these? Yes, nine I do you want games? to talk about before we jump into the content uh, about all that confusion? It's nice to be validated because sure enough, Kotaku comes out. Unfortunately, it's not Jason Schreier, but uh, Ethan Gok. I think that's how you pronounce his last name, uh, has an article on Kotaku. Microsoft sends mixed signals about cross-gen exclusives. I was like, yes, yes, they do. I'm so glad I feel validated that I'm not the only one that's really confused about this. And in summary, they, just, they're, I, it's, what? Just, it's just so baffling to me that they can get this communicate. I mean, but Sony had some weird communication issues too with the whole like, you know, only a thousand games are, or, you know, or a hundred, that's right. They were like a hundred of our games, but that's not what they meant, but they said it wrong. You know what I mean? Like, right. I feel like both console makers right now are just whiffing the communication on a basic level. And it's, uh, it's so disheartening, especially maybe it's because of the coronavirus, I guess maybe we can cut them some slack, but during a console release window, you think that like at what other time in history has Sony been so on coordinated with the communication like they did such a good job i mean starting from sega on like their or their competition with sega on they've just been like clear messages telling players what they wanted during the 2012 e3 they were like we will allow you to have discs and trade get you know what i mean like it's just right it's been well they had a major blunder strong. with playstation 3 that oh yeah okay. and that was they got cocky fair. and they had this crazy expensive thing with the super proprietary hardware it wasn't communicated right and they advertised the best power and the best playability but never delivered yeah outside of the ps3 yeah sony had a very clear concise message with playstation 4 would be one thing if sony was messing up and microsoft was being clear but no microsoft's messing (laughs) it just seems like someone's not proofreading the stuff or like you said or like or like or like you said these these are a bunch of these are nine games that are not coming out until two years into it (laughs) it's like okay because none of these things had release dates exactly no release dates so um 
So there was to add confusion. There were some headlines and band, like little I- icons to look out for, and I was noticing them as the presentation was going on. There is the optimized for Xbox Series X emblem, and then there's the smart delivery emblem, and then there's just like playable consoles, and it'll have like a list of the things that it's capable to play on, and that's Xbox Series X, Xbox One, or Windows Ten, or a combination of those three. The confusion was that they continued Game Pass. to edit they also, the websites. There would also be the oh, yeah, Game, and Pass, Game Pass, yeah. mm-hmm. um, which we'll get to in a minute as well. Uh, the confusion was that Avowed, Everwild were both updated to... <laughs> the headline has been updated to better reflect the confusion over the platforms, and then it was updated again. On Twitter, there was an update that showed screenshots of Avowed and Everwild. These are the Microsoft websites that show the game show the trailer with a link and have like descriptions about them. Um, they had all of the, uh, the Xbox one optimized for a series X stuff added and then completely removed. So the latest version of the website we have was as of eight thirteen AM on the 24th, Microsoft updated Everwild and avowed web pages to remove any reference to them being playable on Xbox one. Huh? So that just means series X only despite what they were saying. So they've, and that was the third update after some Twitter confusion even. So it, it is crazy, but I have in front of me now, this is why I wanted to table the, our discussion about the content till now is that it was very confusing and we still have a lot more to discuss about the, the implications of all of this confusion and the strategy that Microsoft is playing, which I want to say for the end after we go. So we've, we've con we've contextualized, the release of all the games. Now we're going to go in, we're going to talk about the content and our feelings about each of the releases. Right. And, and the we'll, if any of this has been confusing for the last like six minutes has been confusing to you, be assured that every single game we talk about today will not only be playable on Xbox, it will be playable on at the very least. It will be playable on the Xbox series X, the new console, the next gen console. Yep. It'll be playable on a comparable PC that will probably have minimum requirements and mm-hmm. everything will be available on Game Pass. Those are like the three kind of at least pillars that you can trust, meaning that if you yep. pay the $10 a month or whatever for Game Pass, you can play every single game we're talking about on any compatible hardware. Um, yep. Again, those compatible hardwares being the Series X and a PC. So mm-hmm. that is at the very least, if you are a Microsoft fan and you and you are for some weird reason relying on us for all your information uh that is <laughs> the information uh and that is something you can count on so if you mm-hmm. want to buy if this is makes you interested in buying a series x we will not we would not don't let our confusion and distraction dishearten you from that um it will probably be a solid console and uh, it'll have a lot of great games to play on it so we are not getting paid by microsoft to, <laughs> we are definitely not being paid by anybody it's just two dudes that love video games that want to talk about given our stuff. opinions yeah exactly yep so. after we run through the content i do want to circle back talk about game pass talk about some stuff that we saw yep. the labels the smart delivery the optimized badges and, the strategy, and then i want to yep. talk and then i want to conclude our discussion with a strategy compare and contrast between sony and microsoft i love it let's so, do it before let's we do that content so what was announced yep. at this thing 13 minutes into our bonus episode i know <laughs> <laughs> so again not in order of the announcements but in order of the, these are the xbox series x quote-unquote exclusives because pc so state of decay 3 showed this crazy trailer of a woman she was awesome she looked great had a bow very like native you know primal but dressed in what I, I a running joke about like everything is looked like the last of us. It did. So she had like all the snow gear on and she was walking through this beautiful looking environment, super realistic snow. And then there was this deer with half its face missing. It was a zombie deer and it was eating another deer and it was nuts. And it goes, <laughs> and that's yep. the tra- trailer. And, uh, uh, and, and I don't think that any of it was gameplay. I think it was all pre-rendered cinematics as we talked about in our, um, in our episode about cutscenes. So, yep. That's all we saw of the game. Was it in engine? Do you think? I don't know, but I do know that it, it, it looked very pre-rendered and it, they showed no, no actual gameplay. So who knows what it would end up looking like? That's important. It yeah. comes back into our discussion. Factors back into our discussion later. But yep. I do. Um, yeah, and then uh, yeah. So State of Decay. I haven't played any of them, but they're zombie survival horror games. I think. And uh, yeah, they're supposed. They're like known to be buggy and glitchy. And it's an Xbox exclusive franchise made by Undead Labs. 
And a lot of people love State of Decay. I mean, like it it has a small niche market, but people who love it, love it and they play it. It's a little bit more open worldy. And I think there's a lot of co-op things happening involved, but I'm not sure I could be mistaken. So this announcement surprised a lot of folks. Cool. Awesome. But for us, we're like zombie game. Okay, never mind. Zombie deer. <laughs> yeah, uh, I will say the zombie deer was kind of that's a whole twist on it. Like imagine a zombie game, but where all the zombies were animals. So it's like, oh, my gosh, zombie cockroaches. Ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, moving on. Uh, next game that was announced by Turn 10 was another Series X exclusive. And uh, to no one's surprise, Forza Motorsport. Motorsport? Motorsport. Um, yes. I can't talk, apparently. So, yeah, Forza. Apparently new Forza coming out for the Series X. This is the first one after Horizon, right? Forza Horizon was the last one. Yeah, they go back and forth. And Turn 10 is involved in them all, but... Uh, Playground Games makes the Forza Horizon series primarily. Turn 10 like supports them, but Turn 10 is known for the official. So there's the Forza Motorsport line of games. They're on seven right now. So this would be the eighth one. And then there's the Forza Horizon games, which are a little bit more arcadey, a little bit more fun. And they're made by Playground Games and they have four of those. So they are two separate franchises. They're both racing, but Forza Motorsport is the simulator. It is like the premier cream of the crop, like get your racing cockpit built get the legit like physics engine tire rub friction like down to the nitty gritty like this tension in your springs and the wedge adjustment in your spoilers and let's go like that's forza motorsport and so this is the newest one gotcha. they actually didn't label it eight which i thought was interesting it looked absolutely gorgeous and i went back and did there is definitely uh, did- a trend in games right now especially next gen game this gen and next gen games where they just drop the number they i think they're starting to realize the number scheme is getting ridiculous and so they're yeah. just being like <laughs> i mean god of war i mean a game that i adore did it god of war god of war 4 was just like nope uh-uh god of war <laughs> like yep. you already have a game titled that dudes but yeah i mean it's uh, it makes sense because it's getting uh number yeah, schemes like, are getting call ridiculous. of duty modern warfare like uh-huh. they did yep. the same thing yeah exactly uh, so it's it's forza motorsport but also it implies a, f- a platform and not a hard release like it seems like okay mm-hmm. this isn't like a destiny it's they're just going to keep adding content to it it's like there's no number so it doesn't end it's just Forza Motorsport. Here's the service. Games as a service. Open-ended, uh, always online, connected kind of thing. Probably. That's just speculation. But the games look... That was probably, to me, the best looking, graphically, the best looking game that they showed off running it on was Xbox impressive, Series X. Hardware. But I admit, just like any racing game, I, I, I'm pretty sure I tabbed away or went to go to the bathroom or something like that after seeing a few seconds into it. I'm like, cool, the light's reflecting off the cars very interestingly. I'm going to go pee it's now. ray tracing. <laughs> there was reflections <laughs> yeah. of things that are not on the screen. Screen space reflections were not a thing. It was wow. ray traced, and it was cool. gorgeous. Yes. All right. But Next game I love Forza. <laughs> was um, Sne- Sneeze of the Wild. Is that what it's called? Um, what did we call it? Uh, we called it uh, the wild. Did we just call Hori- it Bre- Horizon oh, Zero Breath Horizon of the Wild? Zero of the Breath of the Wild. Or wild? Like yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. Now, rare, rare. Uh, the creators of Banjo Kazooie and uh, B- 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 Sea of no. Thieves. Yeah, Sea of Thieves. That's the other one. Uh, they may they're making a game called Everwild, and it looks like a knockoff of Breath of the Wild. It's got that kind of cell shaded graphics. Look like looks like it's going to be an open world adventure action adventure game uh and uh well, it maybe looks good. like they never said any of that stuff oh, and true. they never showed any that's of that fair. stuff we don't know what it is i thought they Although, had showed off gameplay at one point but maybe i'm wrong about that they didn't they certainly didn't this time you're right they just showed mm-hmm. stuff a bunch of women dancing around speaking of that frogs. you know this this whole entire conference had a lot of awesome representation of minority groups and that is women people of color LGBTQ, I thought it was awesome. And Everwild is a good example of showing colored po- colored people in like a different line, you know, not urbanized, like a different light. And I heard a person of color talk about it. They appreciated it. So I wanted to echo it here when they saw Everwild. It's like, oh, this is fantastic and very refreshing. It's like sure. no, some, it, some new representation. It was awesome. It looks like a, it'll be a fun game. I, we just don't really know enough about it. And, and it looks very much just on the surface like breath of the wild so yeah I, mean, I thought the same art style i thought this is i thought the same thing mm-hmm. of um, gods and monsters that game that they showed off i was like mm-hmm. oh this is just basically assassin's creed odyssey plus breath of the wild <laughs> it's right. like uh there's a lot of games that have been kind of riffing off that style recently and that's good that's fine imitation is the best form of flattery when we get new 
Like it almost feels like new content of the same game when a, a game comes out that's very similar to it. So I, mm. I'm intrigued. Color me intrigued. The, rare. The one thing about this game that it would be a, a deal breaker, as in, as in like I will be sold. I, yes, like indefinitely, is if it is co op because it showed four yeah. different characters, yep. pretty mm-hmm. pretty good like static characters, like you would play together as a team doing some stuff. And yeah. I can't like Horizon's great. Horizon Zero Dawn is that's what I mean. Horizon Zero Dawn is great. Breath of the Wild is great, but those are single player games. They've they don't have a there's no co op like Horizon Zero Dawn thing in the world. When are so we this... gonna have time to play Everwild again? <laughs> oh, I know, yeah, but it's coming to PC, so it's I'm not joking. like we have to yeah. buy the hardware. It's true, it's true. But cool. Um, all right, next we I think we can move on. Anything else about Everwild? I think we're no, it's good. Yeah. Up. Cool. Yep. Uh, the next game that was shown, or not next in order, but the next game that we'll talk about is from everyone's favorite underdog Obsidian finally making stuff in their own IPs. Uh, they blew the world away with the Outer Worlds, and now they're going back to their fantasy roots, and they announced a game called Avowed. Uh, yes. All they showed of it was a bunch of archers shooting fiery arrows over a landscape, then the arrow landed in a tomb, and then there was... Uh, then suddenly it switched to first-person point of view, and a dude like made magic hands and a magic sword appear, and that was it. But confirmed it would be taking place in the first-person setting and then later they or a, a, a dude came on later and said it takes place in the world of ivor which is the world that their other one of their other um games takes place in called pillars of eternity but pillars of eternity is like a top-down isometric like tactical Diablo-ish. uh yeah, yeah rpg like Baldur's gate or whatever uh this is going to be first person and people have been drawing the immediate comparisons to skyrim so if it's anything yeah. like if it's anything like a fantasy, if it's a, if it's like the Outer Worlds, but set in a fantasy in their Pillars of Eternity world, I think it'll be interesting. And Obsidian, we know, has a great, like, voice when it comes to their writing style and their humor and stuff like that. So I'd be interested to see how it turns This is out. probably the thing I'm most interested about yeah, I, I agree. in this entire conference was Avowed. Yes, I agree. <laughs> I am, <laughs> Sorry, I am intrigued as well. <laughs> like uh, any any game that makes the jump of perspective uh in the same in the same franchise uh, makes me intrigued just because it's like oh you are actually taking you're actually moving this game forward you're not just sticking with the same thing and sometimes it's a gamble and sometimes it pays off i mean fallout did this mm-hmm. exact same jump they went from isometric kind of tactical rpg to uh to first person perspective and they're massively successful so i'd love to see Pillars of Eternity do the same thing here with Avowed. But the yeah. graphics looked great. It looked wonderful. So, uh, but again, yeah, how, it how much of it like... was how much of it was pre-rendered cinematic and how much of it was in-game engine? We don't know yet. <laughs> the art style was reminiscent of like World of Warcraft, but yeah. fully rendered. Like World of mm-hmm. Warcraft would be the the potato version of what we saw with Avowed. Like we had full on like textures and walls and bricks and like holes and rocks and particle effects and reflections, probably ray tracing, you know, all these gorgeous effects. Uh, sea of Thieves kind of reminds me of that art style as well. It's like sort of cartoony, but sort of realistic. Right. So yeah. Sea of Thieves being a little bit more cartoony and then World of Warcraft being more realistic for, for its scale of what I'm comparing it to. But yeah, the, the art style of Avowed, was very intriguing too because you get old you get sick of the same stuff right we saw horizon zero dawn's ridiculously realistic gorgeous i mean absolutely gorgeous ghost of tsushima last of us part two i mean these are games that we've been playing that looked you know uber realistic we're used to it it's kind of that and then you had breath of the wild which is this awesome like cell shaded aesthetic yeah which we saw in Everwild, you know just now in this press conference and so like this is kind of like something a little bit different that's not as popular that I enjoy and, and I feel drawn to very blizzard. For sure. Yeah, very blizzard. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, we can have a whole conversation about like art styles and, and feels yeah. of games. Uh, it probably mm-hmm. is something we should put in the pipeline, even though we talk about it a lot already. But seeing, it does seem like people get, developers get stuck in like a handful of like styles. So I would love to, it's just as a side conversation, I would love to see more. I mean, they are continuing to experiment with different styles, but, uh, you know, if we can break away from like one extreme of like super cartoony and stylized and the other extreme of like super gritty and realistic and get more something between or something new altogether uh, would be fun. That's why I'm excited about games like uh, like Biomutant, for example. It's like, it's super, it is like kind of, 
it's colorful and poppy and uh but they're trying to render the game as it's almost like a weird mix of like realistic and cartoony but um with like little furry animals instead of people but anyways yeah. complete tangent let's talk about yeah. the next game i don't even remember uh, what I had this to, game was. i had to move it i had to move it i just looked it up because i wanted to get a fact straight and when i looked it up i saw that it is available on the original xbox one so it's not an exclusive oh, so, I so we're not on this list it. and moving it. It. we're gonna skip that we'll go to ninja theories uh senua saga hellblade, hellblade 2. yeah <laughs> yeah so hellblade 2 looks continues to look amazing it's you know the the sequel to the original one, which I still haven't played yet. Uh, and they showed you this suck. off at their last press conference. I've not played Senua's Sacrifice. I know. At you all. suck. I love it. It's so yeah. good. You need to play it. I would lend it to you if I had a physical copy, but I don't. So you're on your That's own. That's okay. We'll get there. It'll, get on, it'll be on sale at some point. Uh, is there anything to note about this announcement? Did they add any thing new? They didn't. Did I mean, learn anything just new, new s- new footage of again what it could be gameplay or could be pre-rendered footage but no we didn't really learn anything new so they reiterated and showed off good looking stuff about um well the first game game. explored the idea of schizo is it schizophrenia or psychopathia it's even a word uh it's a mix. I mean, it is. It, it delves, explored mental illness greatly. Yeah. Um, schizophrenia is definitely something she has, but schizophrenia, mm. unlike popular understanding, is not just dis- like when you think of multiple personalities, that's that's dissociative identity disorder, and it has nothing to do with schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is literally just hearing hallucinating voices, basically, um, and that's okay. what it is. And then it, it does it beautifully because you they, they sit there and whisper in your ear especially if you have headphones it's like whispering right into your ear the entire time it's nuts uh but uh but they also a a separate thing is psychosis and psychosis is visual i think includes visual hallucinations and other stuff like that which she also has (laughs) it's a they make it a gameplay mechanic which is insane um right and it was uh, totally new like no one who knows i mean i would imagine they're going to continue those themes in hellblade 2 to some level but Mm -hmm. uh yeah we just don't know enough yet we haven't seen gameplay yet so so that's it and then the yeah the next game was the very last and then there's one more kind of moment that everyone already knew was happening and it showed some trees and then playground games across the front and i knew immediately upon looking at the hilt of a sword and a fairy flying onto it that it was going to be the next fable and Yay, sure enough, Fable 4. they announced uh, it, it's a, they dropped the number just like we talked about. Yep. So it's Fable. Fable and <laughs> again, it's definitely a CGI trailer. Absolutely oh, yeah. nothing, nothing in engine or in game at all. But not even implying showed... anything about the time period or whatever. Like yeah, the nothing. other Fable games had like advancement of like they, now we have guns now, but like none of that. Just it's just a new Fable game was confirmed and they showed off a cinematic that gives the vibe of the game. Uh, including a fairy that gets eaten by a frog, which was a pretty admittedly hilarious moment. And that's that's exactly what I was going to talk about. That's the one thing in this trailer that really made me excited about it because there's so many. There was rumors that like Fable was going to go off into this Destiny kind of games as a service model and be all like MMOE and stuff. And I was like, okay, that's that's cool for people who are into that, but I'm not. And I really really loved Fable one and two and three. And they were like single player games, RPGs, kind of exploration, like exploration stuff. And they had a moral scale and the humor. That's what I was getting at. The humor was hilarious. Chicken and, and chaser. Very, <laughs> yeah, like British humor and funny British witty voices. Uh, and the toad eating the the fairy is like, yep, that's exactly what Fable is supposed to be. Yeah. This very irreverent kind of almost burps, burps and fart jokes, but not yeah. quite like that raunchy, but uh-huh. still really funny. Uh, like you can get married in that game. The first game, like the very first fable really set new, but I remember when I, when I first like leading up to that a launch, I was like, there's no way they can do all this in a game. You can do a light and dark path. You can develop your character in all these different ways. You can like marry and like have a house and like set up a, an entire like ecosystem and economy. And I was like, this is nuts. And they did it. And uh-huh. it was awesome. Yep. Nope. So yeah. I'm mean, I'm really excited about Fable. And I if too. it wasn't for it's, Avowed, it would have been my favorite. Yeah, I was gonna say Fable is one of those um, exclusive properties that Xbox has that makes me jealous on Sony's behalf. Because as much as Sony's got, it's like I agree. Fable was one of the first like 
action RPGs that I was like just blown away with. Like, oh my gosh, it's so robust in everything it lets mm-hmm. you do, and kind of, like it just felt like complete freedom and getting lost in a world. And by today's standards, it's not it's not stuff that hasn't been done before. But at the time, it really was ground bake ground baking. I've been saying ground that baking, lot. ground baking. Yep. Like you know, when you take some dirt and you stick it in your oven and you preheat it and all that stuff. Yeah. Ground baking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You, you get jokes like that in the uh, bonus episodes. <laughs> you sure do. All right. But yeah, there's not really much to talk about other than, hey, Fable's happening. So what's next? The Warhammer 40K Dark Tide. And that is by the developers who've been making Warhammer 40K games. The developer name is Fat Shark. Uh, and they have generally been a good mix of different types of gameplay. And... I don't really know a whole lot about this one or the Warhammer 40k video game series, uh, but this is an Xbox Series X exclusive, and I'm actually going to refresh myself on the trailer as we speak. So if there's anything you want to add about this game... I literally don't. I don't even barely remember it. The only thing I remember is that the logo came up that said Warhammer, and I said, oh, it's a Warhammer game, I guess. But Yeah, I- a cinematic trailer... Some yeah, soldiers. Oh, that's right. They had gas guns. masks. So I was like, soldiers and gas yeah. masks is like the new space marine, right? And that, that, yeah, like, so they didn't really show any gameplay, and it's hard to figure out like what this game would be because in the Warhammer series of video games, you do have stuff that's like Darksiders, and you also have stuff that's like Darksiders Genesis, and that is the action RPG uh-huh. top down. You game. also have MMOs. There's so yep. much like, and there's yeah. real time strategy games as well. First so person, who knows? like Morrowind style games. Yeah, who knows what this is going to be? So I imagine if I had caught like kept up with the developer, I could probably make a smarter, educated guess as to what this game Fat Shark. I don't know what else they've made. And so if there's multiple 40 or Warhammer 40 K games coming out from different developers, you can track which ones are going to be based on that. But I don't have that knowledge. So moving on. <laughs> Moving on. Um, the next game is called The Medium, developed by the Blooper Team. They're the team that made what is that game called? Uh, that game. It's a horror game in a mansion of an artist. We played it in my basement in the dark. Layers of Fear. Yes, they made Layers of Fear one and two. So The Medium is their next horror game, uh, which looked really cool like you took yeah so like it's uh the gimmick is that it's there's like i mean she's a medium so she's got one foot in the real world and one foot in the spirit world so she's but like they render and the spirit world is exactly what you would think it it's like she's got like crazy hair and magic and and it's ghosty and there's monsters and then in the real world but like the entire game is rendered in two, like both worlds are rendered at the same time. So you can switch back and forth between them seamlessly. And, um, which again, strikes me as something that's going to rely heavily on an SSD and not going to be playable on Xbox one. Um, but yeah, that's the, exactly. That's my point. (laughs) Uh, so that's the gimmick though, is they render it, um, at the same time, meaning that like, as you're walking through a hallway in, or like an, uh, let's say a hotel in the real world, in the fantasy world, you're walk or the spirit world, you're walking through a castle and there's like zombies coming up on you. So I have no idea how that's going to translate to gameplay, but it did actually look like this was one of the few ones that showed off what looked like gameplay um, because they're showing off how the game was rendered in two, like two or was rendering simultaneously two worlds at the same time. Um, yeah, and if you played Layers of Fear, it looked like that's what they were doing in that game too, just on a smaller scale. Because like you would turn around, in, like in the game, you would be investigating something, and it would get dark and scary. And so you would turn around, and the entire room looks different. Like the doors are in different locations. Everything changed, and you're like, "Whoa! How did they do that without a loading screen?" And they did. And there was some jank, yeah, you know, with uh, they're like an indie studio or a smaller studio, so it's not like a AAA game by any means. But uh, they, so you can cont- like this is definitely the the success and succession of that uh-huh. uh, this is done at a right. much and they higher it, budget i mean they showed it side like, by side and so i'm wondering partially i'm wondering if like maybe that will be an actual feature where like the you can like toggle it in such a way where you actually see both worlds at the same time and your character oh like, yeah i wonder like, on yeah. half like almost split screen i wonder i don't yeah. know that's what they showed maybe they were just showing that as an example but part of me wonders if that's going to be like a thing that you can actually do in the game, which would be and totally something that's not really doable on the current hardware um, or yeah. not anything I've seen done in the current. The closest thing I think is maybe um a way out, but I'm sure there's technical reasons why it's 
is you know they're not rendering the same thing they're rendering different things on different parts of the screen so i guess it's mm. different anyways well that's uh that wraps up pretty much all of the games that may only be on the series x based on title cards and updates and stuff so we can yep. go on and move on these are the rest of the games we're going to talk about have been confirmed on both the series x and the xbox one and of course the pc like we talked about so yep. this one will and then be on... if it's a third party studio it's coming some of these will be on playstation 5 yeah or mm-hmm. playstation 4 even as well so that's what this next chunk of games are going to be um yeah yep cool so uh they started off with a bang this was actually the very first announcement and the very first thing showed off and they showed off halo 6 which is officially titled halo infinite uh by three four three four five studios which took over after bungie left and uh this one's going to be this one did say the whole smart delivery thing so if you buy it for the xbox one uh you can plug it into your xbox series x and it will get all the optimizations and whatever um that come with it so Mm -hmm. yeah have you been following the controversy around this it is insane like almost the last of us part two level of well yeah people weren't blown away by the graphics right like they were and this was exactly my reaction too is i was like it looks like something that could run just fine on a ps4 and or xbox one uh and i read that it was like oh they used an older bill they had a bunch of excuse like Uh 343 had a bunch of or 345 had a bunch of uh is it it's not 345 it's 343 is it three I'm, I'm like dumb. I didn't 90% sure it's 343 yeah, it's three, Guilty four, three. Spark. It's, yeah. named it's named after the Guilty right. Spark. It's named after. Yeah, mm-hmm. okay. Uh, so I'm like, I'm sitting there being like, that does not look right. 345. It doesn't sound right. Yeah, it was saying. typo. Yes. That's fine. Okay, cool. All right, 343, uh, like they had a bunch of excuses as to why it was like, oh, there's still like several months of development left. So we're going to totally have better graphics. In fact, this was an old build of the game. Like that's all I saw about it. But I'm like, in my mind, your, your flagship presentation of what's supposed to be your example of the next gen uh kind of fell flat for me and i imagine other players as well i mean it looked fun it looked fine it looked like halo uh halo is going to be fun because that's because of the sheer virtue of the fact that it's halo but i think people were expecting something to compete with the playstation 5 but we'll discuss uh, we'll discuss later why that's not going to be feasible based on their strategy uh mm-hmm. and uh and that showed off in this too it was like okay it was it looked like the next halo game is all i can really say about it yeah it, it definitely went back to its its roots it looks and it looks like halo one how i would remember it or if it were to come out now on a modern system yeah, yeah. like if halo had never existed and boom, here's the first Halo ever. It's this. Like, that's what this game looks like. They it has back. a grappling hook now, though, which is yeah. totally like, it's a Doom Eternal. I, that's, that's literally what I said. Yeah. I was like, oh, he literally just Doom Eternal that elite there or whatever. <laughs> so. Yep. Um, so in, in the graphic style, is there was a bunch of rumors, like you said, rumor and speculation. It's an old build. Uh, apparently, if you, not apparently, go to Digital Foundry's website on YouTube. They go to their page and click, they do a analysis on the graphics and they address some of the issues that people are complaining about. And the overwhelming thesis of their video is that they chose a horrible time of day in the game segment to show. And that's because the time of day affects lighting. And it all boils down to how the lighting was. And they had all these other games that showed off how uh, dynamic lighting, and that is lighting that is rendered on the fly, uh, how it can affect and make textures and things look bad in shadow. And because the sun was setting and you were fighting in a valley for the most part, everything was in shadow all like most of that, the second two thirds of that whole video. And so they were showing, like I said, they were drawing comparisons to other games that have done similar lighting um, implementations and how it made their models look like the halo models and how it, this is not really indicative of the graphics, but it's not the engine. And if it is an old build, even better because they're probably going to work on some of this stuff, especially after the feedback. And also there will be, and they've promised this an Xbox series X exclusive patch after launch when the console launches. So what we did see was that not applied. So whatever ray tracing or increased texture resolution or whatever enhanced rendering solutions they're going to do, we didn't see that in this reveal trailer. So I think it is is all fine. It is not something that, Oh, it's not. Co- it's, this is not good. Yeah, like I, no, I completely is, agree. This is yeah. a mistake. This is a not misstep. something Microsoft should have done at all. Misstep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I, I completely agree. So it is fair to say what we saw is exactly what you can expect if you own an Xbox One. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, it, 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 was, it was a very cool Xbox One game they showed off. <laughs> but when right. you're trying to put your best foot forward for to sell your new console. Uh, but again, that will factor into our discussion later. So we can we can yep. shelve that for now. Um, mm-hmm. But yes, Halo Infinite, it does look like a, a great Halo game. And they did and add was... they have they mm-hmm. have narrowed the gap between uh the distinctions between the master chief and the doom guy once again by giving <laughs> by giving <laughs> him a grappling hook grappling hook uh, that works exactly the same way as it does in doom eternal <laughs> so <laughs> it's funny uh this was the longest gameplay shown off of any title in this entire presentation like it showed a long it was like five minutes of master chief mm-hmm. running they through confirmed the, world the and brutes are and... back the brutes from halo 3 i don't think we've seen yeah. them since are back and uh mm-hmm. Uh, they're going to be doing mean stuff. The, apparently they name dropped characters uh, so that I don't I'm not familiar with. So uh, there are cool characters from the last two games that are coming back as well. But um, anyways, mm-hmm. uh, cool. All right. I don't think there's anything else that uh, are you excited about Halo Infinite. Do you want to play it? I do want to play it because it's Halo. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I haven't you know, I'm not like I'm going to go out of my way to get um uh, Series X for it by no stretch of the imagination, but I would be willing to play it on Game Pass. Um, Heck so yeah. we'll see. Um, we'll talk about Game Pass more later. Uh, confirmed. Yeah. Also, there is no four player split screen in Halo Infinite. Oh, okay. Don't know if that means boo. there's no two player. <laughs> yeah, right. But if there's no two player split screen, then really boo. But I know based on a tweet that went out uh, today, that was from a, a, a good source that there's no four player. Got it. Split screen. Cool. Yep. All right. So, Don't Not Entertainment, which. What was the other Makes game they did? Life is Strange. Life is Strange, that's right, yeah. So they're releasing yep. a new game called Tell Me Why, which is another, mm-hmm. you know, just nonsensical three-word statement. But um, <laughs> it is, uh, it is. I mean, again, it looks like another great game of the current generation. <laughs> like, it's, it's pretty, but it's um, it's a story, story game. Uh, lots of drama, brother and sister, some such, mm-hmm. and whatnot, and intrigue and murder. <laughs> aspect of this game is that it does focus on transgender characters but not in a mental crisis light so like every single time there has been a representation of transgenders it's usually highlighting the struggle of their life and identifying that way and the struggles that that brings and like the heartache around it this does not apparently this, this there's a whole like fact online that they actually have already shown and have caged it with spoiler alerts for the story. But if you do want to go read about it, uh, it, it, it sheds a positive, like, like transgender people are people too. They love, have happy experiences just like everyone else. And this game is like focusing on that aspect of their life, which is um, again, amazing. We're seeing representation across all minorities ramped up in, in the next couple of, um, in this next generation with all of these games coming out. And I see it on both Sony and now Microsoft side too. Awesome. Moving Mm -hmm. on. I don't really have anything else to say about. Don't tell me why. Yeah. It's actually adventure game like story, just like life Mm -hmm. is strange. Yeah. And it's, it's life is strange apparently is amazing. So the writing is really good that this, the games are awesome. So go check those out. They haven't really been for me. I haven't played them, but yeah, that's it. Cool. All right. Moving on. What's next? So As Dusk Falls, this is the one I had to move out of the other list because this is coming to Xbox One. As Dusk Falls, is a, this is a new studio called Interior Slash Night or Interior Night, and it's in all caps, and I don't know why that they're named that way, but apparently they are people who left Quantic Dream. So that's um, Detroit Become Human, uh, Beyond Two Souls, Heavy Rain, those developers. So people from that company started this studio and made this game, As Dusk Falls, and it seems like it's very much in that vein as far as like dialogue choices and story splitting. And it's it's all that kind of I don't know what you call that game. It's to me, it's always been this is a Quantic Dream game, but it's not Quantic Dream because it's a different developer. Uh, and the art studio is like or the art style is more of a graphic novel instead of like fully 3D rendered models. So it seems interesting if you're into this kind of dialogue choice stuff and like choose your own adventure type games, but yeah, I remember yeah. nothing about this game. So mm-hmm. moving on yep. the next, that was the next thing that was announced was a DLC uh, expansion. I think as they described it for outer worlds. Uh, so yep. it's going to be called peril on Gorgon. Uh, so it looks like a whole bunch of content, new weapons, new planet, 
new story, new content for uh, that game. And uh, they announced that there would be optimizations for the entire game of the Outer Worlds on the Series X. So, mm-hmm. uh, the, yeah, Outer Worlds is getting an upgrade, but it's not necessarily getting it. It's not a sequel. It's an addition to the base game. So, yep. And um, that is coming that to available. PlayStation yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, that's going to be available on all platforms that Outer Worlds is available on. So, yep. Cool. That's all for that. And then Destiny 2 apparently is having its addition to Game Pass. And so that's what this announcement was. Uh, This has major, this blew me away on all kinds of levels. Like a lot of people probably just rolled their eyes and said, okay, more Destiny 2. But here's what happened. Bungie and Microsoft didn't get along. They split up. Activision buys Bungie. Bungie and Microsoft are enemies, essentially, because Activision owns Bungie. Bungie breaks away from Activision, and now we have Bungie completely by themselves, now back in the Microsoft camp (laughs) with a Game Pass, uh, like, Link. And I just thought that whole trajectory, if I just blew through years of of, uh, drama, I guess, or like a story uh, that is of a a topic in and of itself, but the fact that Destiny 2 is now on Game Pass, and this is another thing that blew my mind, all of its DLC is included with Game Pass. So, right, so you, you get don't have the to buy Shadow Keep separately. Version. Right. All you right. Th- finally, finally, Destiny is in a spot where, uh, you know, at least on one platform on Game Pass, you can just pay your 10 bucks a month and you unlock all of Destiny's existing content. Of course, with the caveat that Destiny 2 regularly removes content uh, and makes it, locks it behind a, like, you can't access it thing. Um, so they're right. getting, they're actually purging a bunch of content. But if you just want to play, like, everything that's available in Destiny 2 at the moment, uh, the best place to actually, the most affordable place, I should say, to do that will actually end up being Game Pass, unless PlayStation announces a similar um, thing. But so far, uh, yeah, Game Pass is going to be the place to play Destiny, only due to the sheer virtue of the fact that if you have not, like, yeah, if, if you haven't already been keeping up with it and buying the expansions, then yeah, this would be the place. If you just want to jump into it for the first time, that's probably the best bang for your buck. So that's I mean, cool. Activision's pricing for Destiny 2 is outlandish and ridiculously expensive. And it's a live service game is what you alluded to. So they'll change the fundamental game with new content by removing old content as a consequence. It's not like they're going back and saying, oh, these we need to get rid of and scrap this dungeon. It's like, no, this planet is no longer here in the game and we've moved on to this other stuff. And so all that content is now gone and inaccessible to those who have paid for it but that's kind of the nature of a live service game because it's always online. It's not single player at all. And so this game pass chalk line is the latest and greatest destiny Two at all times without having to buy anything except for the game pass access. And this Mm -hmm. is the first time that I'm aware of any DLC being included anywhere on game pass for any game. So that's also setting reason. For some reason, I recall that that is the case for something when I'm blanking on, I think sea of thieves, I think sea of thieves, you get all, if you oh, pay for well, game pass, you that's get a, all yeah, the that's, content. Yeah. Yeah. That's a first this party. Is a third party. Yeah. This is for yeah. a third party thing. Yes. Yeah, so that's what makes it notable. Sea of thieves is also a live service game. So that's the trend, the commonality between the two. So I think that's mm-hmm. what this is. I'm reading too much into it. If I'm getting excited thinking that they're going to start putting like borderlands three and the season pass on game pass with everything. I, I don't think that's going to happen. Maybe. I think it's but, entirely possible based on this uh, trajectory and based on yeah. the uh, based on. I mean, yeah, I think I don't have any reason to believe that Microsoft and um, uh, the Gearbox. Gearbox? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> take two interactive. Yeah. Take two interactive are on bad terms. So I think they'd be able to work yeah, something out so. at the very least. So, yep. but cool. All right. Well, that I think sums up the conversation about Destiny. Uh, mm-hmm. It's going to coincide more or less with Destiny's new expansion, Beyond Light, which comes out. Uh, in september and uh the pyramids the pyramids that were teased at the end of destiny one are finally showing up and the the true darkness has arrived whatever that oh, means dip. in destiny terms but Go get it now you can harness the darkness as one of the elements and it like freezes people yay Ooh. <laughs> but um it does look like they're doing some cool new things with physics like you can like you can create ice walls and stuff like that for people to jump on but yeah Ooh. whatever um so Cool. Um, yeah, moving on next was the Tetris Effect, which is the Tetris MMO. <laughs> Tetris now, Effect Connected. If you've ever thought that Tetris was like totally a drag more than it already is, but you were like, oh man, I wish that I could have other people screw this puzzle up for me. Now you can have that as a reality because you can 
play Tetris <laughs> alongside people. That's that's all I got from this entire trailer is that like you solve puzzles together and like so like each person controls like a section of the screen and if pieces you control where those pieces land in that but you're connected with other people's puzzles so you have to like you yeah you still have to rely on other people it's everything that was awful about group projects in school but now in tetris <laughs> you really don't like tetris do you <laughs> no i don't care for tetris <laughs> so tetris effect is actually uh, from what i've heard an amazing tetris game with a killer soundtrack and really awesome like puzzle combinations and like innovations in the tetris world uh and then this if you've ever played Tetris Attack for the Super Nintendo or the Pokemon Puzzle League for the N64 and whatever the newest, the Japanese version of Tetris Attack on the Super Nintendo just went live on the Nintendo Switch Super Nintendo service, the online service for Nintendo Switch. And it has a multiplayer component where you're battling each other. When, when you solve puzzles, you stack blocks on your enemy. If this does that, then that's going to be awesome. Tetris Effect Connected could actually stand to be a ridiculously fun puzzle game for those people who like puzzle games. I because I've heard, it, obviously not so you. so like, much. It's yeah. so, but everything you're talking about, you're like, it's crazy innovative for Tetris. I'm like, what did the Tetris blocks, like each block is an entire simulated world and you're like destroying Sims uh, as you crush levels or whatever. Well, like, no, they've done things like spheres or like floating platforms or like moving just, platforms just that you just build make around. It, uh, like, open world exploration game a tetris and yeah, blocks I mean, that's, blocks that's fall coming. from the sky uh, look out katamari damasi it's i coming. want t block as the new smash character <laughs> <laughs> that's all i'm done i'm done ranting about tetris do you have any addition okay yeah no just that's that's cool yay tetris cool yep. uh the next game was called the gunk uh, it's another kind of cartoony, looked like a kind of a platformy game. It actually reminded me a lot of like a reverse Mario Sunshine, um, but like a darker, like dark, gritty Mario Sunshine, because like the world's covered in all this goo and you have to like clean it up with a vacuum. Uh, and then that va- that like the gunk powers your abilities or whatever. I don't know. But that's yeah, they showed off gameplay and it looks like a kind of platformy action game. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, Image and Form is a developer. What did they make? Oops. Let me look that up really fast because that I think it's related to like Odd World, but maybe not. No, it I don't felt think like it, it had that vibe. It oh, did. SteamWorld Dig. Yeah. SteamWorld oh, Dig okay. and SteamWorld Heist. If you played those games, they're on Game Pass now. You can jump in. That definitely had that look look and feel. Um like I guess this is a roguelike type of game. Maybe? Shrug. I don't know. They they, yeah. they didn't show off enough of it to say that for sure, but Yep. So if you know anything about the SteamWorld games, I don't, then it's probably like that. <laughs> cool. That's what you're getting for the low free cost of nothing. A okay. We're, unfortunately, <laughs> we're not in the gaming industry. We don't get to go to events. We don't get special privileges to play these games in advance and write tons of notes and talk about them. And, and you know, like I do my research. I try to figure out the developers. I look at the pedigrees and I do the best I can. With, we can't play everything, but that's what you get. You get what you pay for, folks. Moving on. <laughs> stalker 2 from gsc game world uh if you're familiar with the stalker series it is a post-apocalyptic nuclear fallout type first person shooter game uh i've tried the first couple stalkers many times because that world and everything about it intrigued me so much uh this was before fallout 3 even that i i continue to try and play they are uber realistic they lean on the survivor aspect a lot to the point where i did not find them fun but if you are into the Stalker series or if you've enjoyed games like the Metro series and the Fallout series then, and you want more post-apocalyptic nuclear Fallout, nuclear Fallout, then Stalker is the game for you because it showed more gas masks, more, more Metro gas style masks. That's stuff. why I yep. don't remember it at all because it was just another gas mask game. I swear, this is like the new thing is characters in gas masks. Even The Last of Us, gas masks, gas masks. Mm-hmm. Everyone's wearing gas masks. That's your new gritty hero is the <laughs> gas mask wearing zombie killer. Yay, gas mask. I, I was listening to Gary Witta talk about this whole showcase, and he said he was watching some stuff. He stepped away and came back, and he, came, and he thought it was the same game, and they had switched games, but it looked so similar that he didn't realize it was two different games until later. And Stalker 2, I believe, and Crossfire X, which is coming up. We'll talk about that in a minute were the two but it goes to your point like you were saying like some of these games are a little samey like a little yeah 
it's like a little too much. Hey, Xbox, it's not 2005 anymore. <laughs> yep. Like your games sound like they're your games are looking very much like they're all made in 2005. So, moving along. Fantasy Star Online 2, New Genesis, uh, made by Sega, optimized for Xbox Series X, uh, is another entry in the Fantasy Star Online universe. Apparently, Fantasy Star Online 2 is already out, so this New Genesis is like more content for that. Uh, it is very like MMOE, games as a service, live service stuff. I'm not as super familiar with the Fantasy Star series, although I own some entries. I have the GameCube one that I haven't played, but I want to, uh, to familiarize myself with this franchise. I have Fantasy Star 4 on the Sega Genesis, and I've dabbled with it, uh, and it seems fun, but it is a very Xenoblade Chronicles-looking co-op RPG that could be really fun. If um, It could be. If it that. it yeah. strikes me as this is not a, a, game ser- a game series that has reached a lot of mainstream appeal, from my understanding. Uh, right. The already heavily bloated MMO market uh, only has a couple of games that I can say are successes within that field. And Fantasy Star is not one of them that I would say is. But I will say Fantasy Star Online, the original, the one or the one that came out for GameCube, that was like yep. that was like the first time I ever encountered the idea of an MMO. And I always wanted to play it, but never had good enough internet for it or never bought it, whatever. I just never really experienced it. So uh, Fantasy Star will always be the f- the first one that I ever understood. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's like a space, like a space planet uh, MMO, uh, very anime uh, and its looks and everything, but it strikes me as the kind of MMO with the kind of bloat and overcomplication that just makes the genre drag. Grindy, mm. I imagine. It's incredibly grindy. Um, but whatever. It was like... It's a mixture okay, cool. of like Monster Hunter World, Xenoblade Chronicles, open world, living world. Um, I guess, yeah. Kind of stuff. Uh, it is free to play, so I guess it's not... You know, This is not an Xbox exclusive, so wherever else you want to play it, if you want to jump in, apparently you just go get it. And I don't know when it comes out. Got but it. Cool. It is. Yep. All right. Yeah. Speaking, uh, you mentioned Crossfire. Crossfire X is coming out. It is uh, a partnership between Smilegate and Remedy. I read about this yes. later because I was, I was okay, like, Remedy? Yeah. What? Um, mm-hmm. But apparently Remedy is designing the single player. They wanted to do a right. campaign, like a single player campaign mm-hmm. for it. And uh, but it's an existing like first person shooter almost I, I i wouldn't say i wouldn't say that it's um any gameplay like a gameplay wise anything like um overwatch but it's kind of got that like overwatch valorant where it's like it's this rich world they've created but all they've done with it is just make a multi like a multiplayer like first person competitive first person shooter with no story context whatsoever no actual story context so they partner with remedy to like make an actual story context um, so it's one of it's it's remedy branching out into doing multiple projects at once. So they're not mm-hmm. they're not forestalling their what presumably people think they're going to be working on control two. Uh, they're not forestalling that they are working on it alongside. Um, they have a different right. dedicated team for Crossfire X. So uh, that's all I know about. It. it looked like it had some kind of like cool sci fi, uh, you know, um, interesting mechanic stuff that like, you know, that remedies become known for with um alan wake and quantum quantum break and control where they Mm. have like interesting crazy you know paranormal sci-fi mechanics uh so it looked like it had a little bit of that but it also looked like a very standard first person you know like yeah i was was, like watching this i'm like is this battlefield 6 or is this the next call of duty or (laughs) like what is this and it looks the biggest analogy now that you're talking about it you're fleshing it out makes me think of the titanfall universe and apex legends it's like Apex mm, Legends yeah. is the multiplayer component. Titanfall has the single player campaigns behind them and they're set in the same universe. Of course, that's all respawn. It's not two different developers, but one is like the the Overwatch style battle royale, like character based shooters with unique abilities. And then there's the Titanfall, which is like the uh, like a multiplayer game. Like it, it's like mm-hmm. Call of Duty or Battlefield. It's just like here's except you fight in giant. Yeah, I don't know enough about fun, Crossfire, but... but the the feeling I got is it's very it's much less any of the supernatural sci fi elements are going to be toned down significantly. Um, and it's very much going to be like a gritty military shooter above all. So oh, it'll be interesting. Okay. I will probably not ever play it, even though I love I've become a big fan of Remedy since Control. Uh, I will probably not play it. So <laughs> nice. Um, cool. Uh, I do have Alan Wake 
and I'm trying to get my hands on Quantum. I got Alan Wake for a dollar, so yeah. I need to play it at some point, and I really want to grab Quantum Break. Looks awesome, but um, Quantum Break is cheap. I remember seeing it on Amazon. Like its cheap. retail price right now is like nineteen ninety nine. So I'm trying to snag it at like the below ten dollar price on Steam or something. But um, anyways, oh cool. right, I'm looking at the Xbox version as well. You're looking at the PC, but I see it for fifteen bucks on Xbox. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. All right, cool. Uh, and then last is. I don't even know what this is. So <laughs> okay, so Balen no Wonderworld, uh, Balen Wonderworld was shown off. It's a Square Enix game. It's developed by the guys who did Knights. We talked about this in our Sonic um, episode. So the people who made Knights into Dreams were also the people who made some Sonic stuff and Sega's World. And they're now coming out with their own. This is a third party game. It's coming to Xbox. It was announced right before the real show started. It was like a pre show announcement, but it looks absolutely wonderful. It is a 3D platformer what you would come to know and love from like the rareware days of just these open, cool collectathon, like cartoony world, uh, but wrapped up in a more higher budget than like ukulele has been or lucky tail or Fox's lucky tail. What is that game called? I can't even remember. Um, but those, those games tried to capture that magic and that's it. Lucky's lucky's tail. How about that? Uh, Super Lucky's Tale is one of these types of games. Anyway, this looks more polished and a little bit more higher budget and like in that world, if you're interested in it, uh, I wanted to highlight it here because it looks really cool. Go check out a trailer for Balin Wonderworld and it seems really fun. Cool. Yeah, I missed that one, I guess, because it was in the pre-show, but um, yep. awesome. Well, that's it. That's all that was announced. Yay, we got through the entire There's list. So. Yeah. Um, yep. so now we can kind of break down and talk about, uh, things like game pass DLC, and we can talk a little bit about, uh, what their w- break down kind of what they're trying to go for and what they're trying to sell, sell to us. So I, you had an idea. So where you want to go with this? So, yeah. So I want to talk about game pass. Um, every single one of these games, Microsoft opened out the gate, said everything you see in this entire presentation. I don't know how many games we just went through. I could count them, but it's a lot. Everything is on game pass. Okay, Game Pass, the base subscription costs $10 a month. Game Pass Ultimate, I believe, is 15 a month. Let's look this up, because I want to make sure I get the price right. So, stand by. Do you know the prices for all this stuff, by any chance, off the top no, of No, I will I'll buy you time and say, I know there is, there's Game Pass, which just is their, like, Netflix for games, their library of games. There is Game Pass, there's another version of Game Pass that includes the Xbox Gold membership, the Xbox Live Gold membership. So you get, again, the library of games and the capability of playing them all, all, all online with your friends. Uh, and then there is uh, also presumably the games with gold. So you get the free games with gold in the same way that you would the PlayStation um, PlayStation Plus games. And then the last, I don't know if that's the Game, Plus, all, game Pass Ultimate, but there's the last tier where you can spend like 60 bucks a month and get the lease on an actual piece of hardware as well as Xbox live and Xbox game pass. And it's all bundled together um, in a like $60 a month for two years subscription. So what you just talked about was called Xbox all access. All access that's, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. That still kind of exists, but you can't, it's all sold out everywhere. And so I looked it up today before the show start, before we did this to see if what, what that looked like, what that was, and it's nowhere. It's all sold out and it's done. So I guess it exists for people who have bought in, but you can't buy into it anymore. Also, Microsoft seems to have gotten rid of their Xbox Live Gold one year subscription. That's the $60 a year. Right. Yeah. That has been in place since the launch of Xbox Live in 2002, 2001 on the original console. Uh, so that's crazy that they're actually canning that. Uh, so what we have are the Xbox Live gold subscriptions for one month and three month increments those do have the free games each month like you highlighted with the free playstation plus game like like that like analogy to the psn for sony side so you get free games every single month and allows you to play online with your friends then you have the whole game pass thing which is the like you said netflix subscription there's a game pass for the xbox consoles themselves that's ten dollars a month that gives you access to ridiculous amounts of games then there's an Xbox Game Pass for PC that's separate. That's $5 a month. That's just for all of Xbox's games that are available on PC. And then there's the Ultimate. The Game Pass Ultimate takes both of those two Game Pass subscriptions, $10 and $5, merges them together for $15, and then throws in Xbox Live Gold for free. 
So that's the best value by far. So all of that mm-hmm. to say is all of these games that generally you would have to spend $60 or you know, maybe 40 to $70 per title on games that you're interested in add up really quick. Or you can spend $15 a month and have access to all of them. Like that is by far the best deal in gaming period. Yeah, Hands for down. sure. Like, I mean, I read a, nothing cheaper. Forbes had a good article from one of their writers, David Thier. And he was like, he was like, I kept watching this, the showcase. And in the back of my mind, I was saying they're not selling Xbox series X's. They're selling game pass. Like, yep over and over again they're like all of these are available on game pass every single title card even if they made mistakes about what was and was not available on the xbox one and series x they every single one of them had game pass on it so like yep they are selling they are pushing game pass hard and that's what they're selling and quite frankly that is probably the most successful thing that they've got going for them right now because termites right that is the single best value in gaming being able, being able if you pay 15 dollars a month you can get all of these games and all of the Xbox future Xbox exclusive, anything, any single game that you're thinking like, man, I wish I bought, I was going to buy an Xbox for that. You don't have to, you can play it on your PC uh, and you can, you'll, and then throw in the Xbox live portion of it, which allows you to play them with your friends online. Like really is a good value. Yeah. I agree with termite. It is the best value in gaming. uh, And there's another implication that we skipped two games on this list. We have to go back and talk about them. And I will use those two games as the perfect example to highlight this point about Game Pass. Yes, it's the best deal in gaming. Yes, you want to play Halo Infinite, but you don't want to spend $60. So you spend the 15 bucks and you have it. You can play it as much as you want. But now there's no question about whether you want to play Double Fine's new announced game, Psychonauts 2, that maybe you're interested in that. And so Double Fine is coming out with their new game, Psychonauts sequel to the first one. Um, there's a partnership with Jack Black. This, Jack this trailer Black, showed... Mm-hmm. Jack Black sings the title song, the main theme in it, and it's this crazy psycho, like, sedelic, like, art, cell shaded ish, but 3D rendered world. I don't even know what kind of game it is. Maybe it's a, a platformer that's like a third person jump through hoop. We, we were actually trying to guess this as we saw the game, but it might not be something you would spend 20, 30, or $15 on, but it's on Game Pass. Like, you bought Game Pass because you want to play Halo, you have that. So you want to play Psychonauts 2, just go jump in. Just go check it out. Play it for a day. If you don't like it, uninstall it. The barrier of entry is the download time. Like, it is amazing. Game Pass, is, it just blew me away. And I have so, so many times opted, like, fought the temptation to just go buy into Game Pass and play what's available on PC and my Xbox One. I have a base console that's not powerful at all. It's the launch model. And... And just play like some Xbox games. Like I love this idea of Game Pass. It is so consumer friendly. I don't know how long they can keep this up. I don't know how it's profitable. I don't know the back end numbers. Apparently, third party developers who have put their games on Game Pass have cited they make more, they sell more, it's more exposure. It's it's other people who don't have Game Pass buying copies of it because those who do have Game Pass are playing it and talking about it. I don't know. Uh, but there's another game we skipped. Uh, by obsidian obsidian is very busy apparently because they're coming out with a game called grounded and this actually looks very fun and this is a co-op arena shooter with the idea of you being shrunk honey i shrunk the kids esque in your backyard and you have to build like Fortnite's building like forts so <clears throat> i don't save the world mode i think is what it's called so grounded is that but you're a bunch of kids and it has this really cool like cartoony aesthetic art style to it and it's online um team versus team kind of arena shooter. Like I said, sounds awesome. Not something I would want to spend 30 or $40 on, but it's on game pass. So if I want to play with Dan penguin man over here, Hey, let's go try out grounded. And he's got a game pass subscription. I got a game pass subscription. We have a mixture of PC and Xbox. It's cross platform. So it doesn't matter what you're playing on. You can just go play. And like, this is amazing. I can't like, if I went back to myself as a kid and said, Hey, 15 bucks a month and you can play all of this stuff. I would have probably never bought a PlayStation. <laughs> yeah. Like this is the only absolutely downside incredible. is that like you lose it if you stop paying the subscription, but still that's, right. that's still a great value. Um, but you that's don't what lose anything to... though. It just pauses it. Sure. Like sure. You just lose you, access. You just lose access to it. Yeah, all your exactly. game saves are still there. Your account's still there. Your achievements are all still there. It's just like pause. Mm-hmm. You don't pay the money. Fair. Just pause. Yeah. And then when you do pay the money, you're, you're right back where you left off. You don't miss a beat. Yep. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's 
it's definitely interesting, but I think, do you have anything else you want to add before talking about um, their strategy here and breaking down their strategy and how it um, the PlayStation? Let's, let's talk about smart delivery and optimized for Xbox Series X. Sure. Oops. And the confusion there. And the, and the confusion and how that kind of shows out mixed messaging as far as next gen, because it's a good segue topic to go into our strategy. So the idea, and I've copied and pasted the definitions of these two terms from their website, and I'm still trying to figure out exactly what it means. So there's two labels that I'm talking about here. One, it says optimized for Xbox Series X, and it's this cool logo with like some green triangles and some text, and it's on plastered all over all, all of these things. Then there's this other little icon badge called Smart Delivery. To me, Smart Delivery is... You buy the game once, so you buy a disc, and it doesn't matter what it says on the disc as far as what console it's for. You can put it into any single Xbox console, and you will automatically download the version of the game that runs best on that hardware. Yeah, or so theoretically, you can, if you've bought a digital version of it, it would just be in your library. It would across be in your library your, across them. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Then but there's like the, opti- the better version. Yeah. Like you'll have the 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 two separate versions. If you fire up your account on the, in your library on the Xbox one, you have the Xbox one version. If you fire it up on the series X, you have this. So it's, it's the idea of like, you get the best version of the game for the hardware that you have um, is my idea. Yeah. Like my understanding mm-hmm. of smart delivery. Mm-hmm. So what, what confuses me then is it makes the next badge superfluous optimized for Xbox series X. Well, if a game says smart delivery, like halo infinite, and I put my Halo Infinite Xbox One disc into my Series X, I'm getting the best version, which is the one for Xbox Series X. So why does it have a badge that says optimized for Xbox Series X and a badge for smart delivery when smart delivery achieves the goal of optimized for Xbox Series X? So that confuses me, which is this the starting point of this conversation. And I'm like, okay, optimized for Xbox Series X means... It's on all previous consoles, but you get a free optimization patch for Xbox Series X. Again, it sounds like smart delivery. So, yeah, I mean, the only the only thing that I think and I broke this down with you and I, I don't know if this is the case or not. But what it makes me think is when I, you know, when I was talking to you, I was like, the only thing I think is if any game that doesn't say smart delivery on it implies to me that. If it says optimized for Xbox Series X, sure, you can play it on your Xbox one, but if you want to play it on the Series X you have to buy a separate copy of it, which we already knew that EA was going to make you do. Like we knew that some developers were going to make players buy two separate versions of it if they wanted to play it on both mm-hmm. consoles. So by by sitting by putting the badge on there that says this game is optimized for Series X, but without smart delivery would imply to me that you have to you would have to buy two separate versions of it, meaning you should probably wait to buy it until the Series X comes out <laughs> or until you can get your hands on the Series X uh, because yeah. you're not going to be able to go backwards with it. Uh but that's the only like because you're right. It's like, why would you have smart delivery and optimized on the same game if there wasn't a difference between those things? And yep. that's the only difference I could think is that means they're separated. If they're if the smart delivery is not there, it means they're separated. Or as we were talking about earlier, the games that only said optimized for the Series X are coming out in two years or whatever. <laughs> yep. And it's all this it's this confusion that's muddled with it started with these half step consoles. It's something I've talked about from the get go when they talked about smart delivery, it was very first talked about. This was a forward compatibility issue, not a backwards compatibility issue. It's it's, that's why I think the smart delivery stuff started being talked about because there was an Xbox one X and an Xbox one. And it was a half step console, you know, we had the PS4 and the PS4 pro and it was like, if you bought God of War on PS4 and you had a pro, you automatically get that patch, the enhancement patches. They were going back to their back catalog, like Infamous Second Son, and like patching those games to make them run better on the PS4 Pro. They were doing the same thing on the Xbox side, making them enhanced for Xbox One X. And so because of all of that, no one ever had to buy two copies of those games. So this is a generation switch, which people were implying or uh, assuming there would be just like there was a PS3 version of Assassin's Creed Black Flag and a PS4 version of Assassin's Creed Black Flag. And if you bought one on PS3, you didn't get the PS4 one for free. You had to go buy the PS4 copy. 
But then third party developers for Battlefield 1, EA, actually had a five or ten dollar upgrade fee if you bought the game digitally on PS3 and you wanted to bring it forward on PS4, you could just buy the patch for it to like enhance it. So I guess that precedent had been set. And then this smart delivery was supposed to address that saying, okay, if you buy this game on this console, you'll get the Xbox Series X enhancements for free. So what really just threw a wrench into everything was this whole optimized for Xbox Series X moniker, which on their website, all it says is games featuring the optimized for Xbox Series X badge will showcase unparalleled load times, heightened visuals, and steadier frame rates at up to 120 FPS. These include new titles build, built natively using the Xbox Series X development environment, as well as previously released titles that have been rebuilt specifically for the Xbox Series X. So that tells me that's when they're rolling in the solid state utilization. Because, because if you have a smart delivery game, say it's Battlefield 5. It's smart delivery. There's going to be an enhancement patch for Battlefield 5. Well, it's an old gen game. It's already been made. It's already been designed. It's developed. It's shipped. It's produced. It's done and over with. They can make an optimized patch for it to increase the visuals, but you can't go into the game and completely reprogram and rebuild the entire thing to optimize for a solid state drive and then make that the new patch. Like that's way, that goes way farther than like the scope of a patch. So I think this helps me like externally process what the difference is. So if it's optimized, right. so of course for all of X, these, yeah, all of these games are new games or for the most part. So they're being optimized for the series X, which means that like, you know, halo five is not optimized for the series X because it's an old game. It'll have enhancements in the series X, but it's not, it'll, it'll look like the Xbox one X, but it's not being optimized as opposed to all these games. Of course they're new games. Of course they're being designed with the new hardware in mind, but yeah, I don't know. It is confusing um, and a little redundant and too many logos. It's just like it's just it's, a lot. It's too many logos with with cool catchphrases. And it's just like Microsoft. So you need to simplify. You need to reduce and simplify and just make things. I get they're trying to go for a very consumer friendly approach. But what it ends up doing is it ends up confusing consumers. And I don't want to imagine being an un games educated parent trying to buy a new console for their <laughs> kid next Christmas. Not this Christmas. This Christmas is right. going to be confusing. Well, this Christmas will just be this Christmas be not available because it's going to be too hard to get your hands on one. But the following Christmas when, you know, they'll have the, the, the newer manufactured line or whatever. Uh, it's just, it's going to, yep. it, it be suddenly becomes non-consumer friendly when you don't, when you haven't done days and days of research and are following the industry like you and I are, you're going to have right. people like you and I are going to have to be the people who educate the masses and say, okay, yeah, so here's how this works. And we barely under, we barely understand what the difference is. So right. <laughs> like, we simplify it in our minds by being like, yeah, of course, these games are going to run better on the series X and these games, these new ones are actually being designed with the new hardware in mind, but that's not the message that Microsoft is giving. And that's why it's, right. that's why it's, obnoxious the way it exists right now Um, and the stuff we've uncovered since this announcement since the showcase which happened thursday last week and i think this is going to go live tuesday so if it's tuesday then it's today um so it's only been five days they have come out and we've uncovered the idea that they've canned the xbox live gold and they've discontinued the xbox one x which was weird so it does seem like they are trying to like streamline or at least reduce and I didn't mean to train wreck the conversation by saying this, but now it might lead that way. And you can course correct if you want. But the Xbox One X is now the current generation's best console to play on. They're canceling, they're canning it. And they're going to come out with a new Xbox Series X and then an unannounced Xbox Lockhart, which is rumored to be a Series S. That's a weaker version of the X. So now we're going to uh, have an Xbox One S. They'll probably have right. digital versions of both of them too. So you'll right. Have... Well, they already have the digital version of the One S that I already know. exists. The set, yeah, right? So, ne- so now you'll have an Xbox uh... One S console, an Xbox Series S, and then an Xbox Series X. And what will happen though is you have three different consoles of Xbox that will span the price points between two hundred and I'm guessing five or six hundred for the Series X, and then that Lockhart one will be in the middle somewhere, like three or four hundred. So they're going to target all three price points. So when an uneducated parent walks in 
They're like, okay, I want to get. I want the my latest. son wants an Xbox. My son wants yeah. a, the latest Xbox. Okay. And then they're gonna be like, well, <laughs> here's three options. How much do you want to so spend? So here's a chart. Yeah, they're gonna have to right. have a chart. Yeah. yeah. And like, oh man, it, it is a mess. But at least they're getting rid of the. I understand why they're getting rid of the one X because that would just be a weird. Yeah. Con- like to have four different consoles is is the new Lockhart as powerful as the one X is now? Are they just replacing it? Or is it going to have like the one X with the solid state enhancements that that stuff? We have no idea. And yeah. that's probably what it is. It's probably just gonna be a one X with like the solid state enhancements to make it more like the series X architecture. But who knows? That's yeah. then I said train wreck conversation. I didn't mean, to do that. That's fine. But that's okay. It, it segues is nicely. part of their strategy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So speaking of their strategy, how does, how does, we'll just start with the basic question. How did this showcase the Xbox Microsoft showcase compared to the PlayStation 5 games showcase that they, they came out about a month away from each other. Uh, how did they compare? What can you glean from their strategies and their approaches um, between these two different consoles that are in direct competition with one another for the holiday release series season? We knew PlayStation or Sony strategy coming off the heels of the CE, uh, GDC, Mark Cerny, uh, like go th- like announcement of the hardware, the really in-depth making it really, really easy for developers to make their games and make their visions come true or like make their visions and stuff. The best place to develop for is going to be the PlayStation. And we can see that strategy play out in what Sony unveiled in their software lineup showcase, which was all software. And it was all incredible. It was highly professional. And of course it had its ups and downs. There was a good mix of games, stuff we cared about, stuff we didn't, but their first party stuff hit and it hit hard and it looked gorgeous. Spider-Man, Ratchet and Clank, Horizon Forbidden West, um, and I'm probably uh, Gran Turismo Seven. Um, so again, all different genres, ridiculously high quality, and there is no doubt they have drawn a chalk line and said, "This is the next generation. These are the games that are only going to work yeah. on PlayStation." If you 5. buy a new PlayStation, you get games that you can't get on the old Playstations. Like it's an yep. incentive to buy the new console. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it, a very primal incentive of I want to play that game. I can only play it on this console. Yep, and there are reasons for that because the new console has hardware capabilities that they don't want to stifle development from the developer's point of view. Sony right, is very, they don't want to force the developer to downgrade the game just because right. they have to, it still has to run on the PlayStation 4. So that, let's let's stop there and just say that is the biggest difference I, I noticed. Yep. Like, I was blown away by the PlayStation 5, some of the games. I, I was blown away by Square Enix's new game. I, I'm blanking on it right now, but the one, the one with Athia? the... Athia, yeah. I was yeah. like, man, this is cool. I was blown away by Rift Apart. I was stoked about Forbidden West. Like, uh, these games, uh, they showed beautiful visuals. They showed new, innovative techniques as to what is possible with rendering environments and rendering assets. Uh, and it was like, okay, the next generation's real. It's not just about, like, beauty it's about speed now too which is great which is mm-hmm. exactly what we've needed because this console gen this current generation is dragged in regards to loading times and stuff like that yep. so like thank god we're finally getting away from that xbox didn't show any of that and the entire time i'm watching it, i'm like oh that's right because these freaking games have to run on the xbox one they have to run on the outdated hardware and that was the biggest right. like disappointment is like i wanted to see i wanted to see I wanted to see Halo Infinite on the PS5. You know what I mean? Like the equivalent. You know what I mean? Like I wanted to yeah. see those kinds of visuals and those kinds of new emergent gameplay uh, and emergent possibilities uh, from from uh, Microsoft. And that's not what I saw. I saw, I think I said it, the first, one of my first comments about the game was, wow, looks like an, just a pretty PS4 game. You know what I mean? Like a pretty yeah. Xbox One game. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, obviously there's some, there's all that confusion that we've already hashed a million times over like what is and is not going to be um, actually utilizing the hardware to its best fullest capabilities. And I imagine we will see Xbox catch up, but they are not putting their best foot forward. And they have been, uh, they have been really dragging on putting their best foot forward with this console. Um, And again, that harkens back though. Is their strategy to sell consoles or is their strategy to sell game pass? Right. I don't know. So it is definitely where Sony has a developer focused strategy, enabling the developers to do the best they possibly can and make their jobs easier so that there is more content at higher quality. Microsoft has shifted their focus to the consumer. They want you to play any of their games anywhere you want 
on your phone via the cloud project X cloud, which they didn't show anything about in this, but we know it's happening. So I can hook up an Xbox controller to my phone anywhere in the world and play whatever game I want. Then I can go home and play on my Xbox one that I have. I can't afford to upgrade. So I still have it. And I'm going to be able to play the latest and greatest Xbox games downgraded to that. And, and then I can go to my job maybe where I have a gaming PC, which I don't, but you know, people do. And like, I can play the better quality versions of the same games. The game saves are all in the cloud. It's all there. I can just play this one. I can play Halo Infinite anywhere I want. And so there's this consumer focused accessibility strategy that Microsoft has been pushing. They know they lack first party exclusives. They know they lack first party high quality games and they bought nine studios and we saw almost all of them hit with their next titles, Fable included, except for like three. And I don't remember what those three studios are that we did not see what was coming next. But we have Double Fine, 343, Playground Games, Turn 10, um, etc. Ninja, Ninja Theory, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. Ninja Theory. Uh, we know what they're all making. Rareware, Undead Labs. Uh, I think In Exile is another one that didn't show off something. But we know that they're getting there. They're getting... They're, like you said, they will catch up. So here's like that totally different strategies. Microsoft is definitely the much richer company. They're huge. They have way more money to throw around. They can afford to take a loss on the hardware. They can afford to invest in all of these studios right now. And hopefully it'll pay dividends later for them. And eventually after all the dust settles and the original Xbox consoles are phased out because you can, you have to have a Series X or an equivalent PC or higher to play whatever's coming out, Halo Infinite 2, whatever, it's not a thing, but, you know, like whatever's next, then they'll kind of be in line with where PlayStation is, where, where PlayStation's way more aggressive in getting the consumer to buy new hardware, which is way more expensive on the consumer, but you get a higher payoff immediately because you get access to all these mm-hmm. new games yeah. and full backwards compatibility with your original PlayStation titles, some yeah. of which will be enhanced to the PS5 version. And so they're both playing and skirting these lines. And it's This is awesome because it's two entirely different strategies. It almost makes the console wars irrelevant. It almost does, yeah. It's almost like they're not even... I mean, and Microsoft more or less said as much. They're like, we're not trying to compete with console sales anymore. And, and that... When you think about it from that perspective, like it often awfully seems like they're trying to, but at the same time, when you think about it from the perspective of that's what the context they provided is, they're not trying to sell consoles; they're trying to sell mm-hmm. Game Pass. And like, so if I can get into predictions here for a bit, uh, yeah. like my uh, the way I think this is going to go, I, I think that Sony will win the console war. Period. Yep. Xbox is bowing out of the console war in a way that could pay off really interestingly down the line, like imagine imagine microsoft getting like microsoft again they're trying to sell game pass and they're trying to usher people into this idea of play anywhere you want because they're trying to they're they're going to release x cloud and it's going to be the next big thing hopefully is i think they're, they're they're banking on i fully believe that microsoft will eventually just be like yeah we make consoles but they're more like pcs now and uh they're more just like you know they're they're more just like a little bit easier to plug and play gaming pcs and i could easily see microsoft being like like i can see 2025 microsoft announces game pass now available on playstation game pass now available on nintendo switch you know what i mean or whatever the right. nintendo console is like backed by project I X see Cloud them, hardware yeah. right i see them leveraging mm-hmm. their subscription models and their their install base on their user base i should say on those models and then being like you truly want to play anywhere playstation (laughs) like like you know what i mean like cut a deal with us sony where you can you can get people to like play our exclusive games on your on your hardware uh because why not like why not like there's nothing at this point stopping them from doing that uh and Mm -hmm. they don't care about selling consoles anymore so why not just let people play on hardware so that's my prediction i think that's that maybe not that specifically but i think that's kind of the idea they're moving towards is like sure if you want to buy hardware you can play our games and they'll run great on our hardware but you know what say you want to play a switch compatible game like game pass for switch game pass for um for playstation like i can see that being a real reality based on the strategy they're trying to roll out um, and some of those barriers have already been crossed with like Minecraft mm-hmm. and I think uh, Rocket League for a while on Switch to get to the cross platform capabilities. You had to sign into your Xbox account. It was weird. I don't know. Maybe if you guys listeners have done that, one of the cross platform games, um, Fortnite, 
I, I don't remember which one it was, but you had to like log. It was a thing. It was like, oh, I'm on a Nintendo console and I have to log into my Xbox account. This is crazy. It's kind of like put the toe into that door, into that crack you're talking about mm-hmm. where you can yep. see Xbox kind of becoming a service. And it's funny you mentioned the whole PC scalability thing because someone asked Phil Spencer directly, doesn't this stifle creativity on the developer side if they're limited by old hardware? And he said, he basically said that developers have been developing games for PCs for decades that still work. And they continue to innovate and push new boundaries on PC. And they're not limited by the hundreds of thousands of of graphics cards and processors Mm -hmm. that are available. So they're already doing this on the PC side. Xbox is now aligning with that. And it kind he's not wrong, but I can see where the messaging is mixed because developers have always developed a game unless they're a PC exclusive with a fat deal with steam or valve or Epic game store. It's you know, put that aside a developer. If you want to stand up a new studio and make a new game, you're going to go where the, the most bang for your buck is. So you're going to make it third party and you're going to try and put your game everywhere. And if you're going to put your game everywhere, you have to look at the limiting reagent. And in this case, it's the switch. So you have to make your game work on the switch and then you can upscale it you know, to make it fit on other platforms. Well, that's what has happened in the PC market for also for decades. And what is now for the first time in gaming history ever been happening is Sony is now pushing developers to optimize for this new solid state hard drive architecture that's never been done before, except in the console space that PCs have to catch up for. Like there's going to be new minimum requirements on some of these Xbox Series X games that are doing this solid state drive stuff where you're going to have to be like, yeah, it's on Game Pass for PC, but you can't play this game because like Rift Apart, where you have like instantaneous level transitions that are happening, you can't do that without a solid state or without this hardware. So you're moving the PC forward to chase after the consoles. Before, it was always developers are going to make a game. And that kind of, it's not new. Like for PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360, games like Dead Space and Dragon Age and other other third-party titles were always developed to work on the PS3 and Xbox 360 consoles and then ported to PC and prettied up. So unless they're a PC exclusive, the consoles have always limited the development. And so like Phil Spencer's discussion about how Xbox is lining themselves up with PCs and how it doesn't limit developers, it doesn't really answer the question all the way. Uh, but Sony right. is it's pushing it. Yeah, it's certainly a strange a strange thing to like bring up. You're like, oh, so <laughs> you're you're admitting that you're limiting developers because you're saying PCs have been limiting developers for years, and we're just now, uh, you know, lining up with that. It's it's it is a weird it is a weird. It's thing. not his exact quote, but that's essentially what like what he was saying. And yeah. so I don't want to misquote him. Phil Spencer is an amazing guy. He is not anyone to pull any one like he he's not conniving he doesn't lie he's very truthful he's down to earth and he's very accessible and like he's on twitter he's answering questions he's in the weeds he's a he is the reggie fils of xbox by far like this guy is awesome it would be a dream of mine to meet him so when i like i I love that guy he's awesome and he's done because he took over microsoft xbox brand after the original xbox one flop happened Phil Spencer's the one that's been co- course correcting for this entire generation. Yeah, no, for sure. And he's but knocking it out of the park. He's not. So, he, uh, he's yeah. not immune to you know mis mis saying things or misrepresenting things or even just making mistakes over the course of what his strategy is. So yeah, um, yeah, but we'll see. I think that I do think that PlayStation will win this console generation, but I'm interested to see in five or ten years what happens to console at all. Uh, Mm -hmm. And whether or not this entire idea of console wars begins to fade into the background as a thing of the past. Um, And then whoever succeeds in that regard, you know, moving forward, um, I think that will Mm -hmm. depend entirely on the quality of the games and how accessible they are. Uh, I think accessibility will become um, a a new defining selling point of of the next 10, 20 years. So and accessibility is what Microsoft has pioneered with the um, the controller. Yeah. Are, are you well, talking been, about games being accessible or are you talking about disability? I, I was I was implying both, okay. but uh I mean yes, uh the disability aspect of it is going to be important too, but I also think that like just yeah, the availability I should say of games on multiple pieces of hardware gotcha. I think will be will be um or multiple avenues of play. I think will I think Microsoft strategy is a long one um and we have yet to see the fruit of it. Uh but we will, I, mean, I think, in the, yeah. last, in the next few years. But anyways, Microsoft is also pioneering cross-platform more than anyone else. They're pushing for cross-platform play, which makes sense because if you're getting your game on Game Pass, 
you want developers to be able to it's increase their install base on Game Pass, but then also continue to increase that install base by reaching out to Sony and Nintendo and getting more players for your for the next Apex Legends or for the next Fortnite, uh, next PUBG, those types of games you're going to want cross-platform play, the next Borderlands even, right? If Borderlands was cross-platform, could you imagine how big the internet space would be? It would be insane. Like, uh, I, well, yes, but I'm salty about Borderlands because their matchmaking system is just bunk and broken. Like, it would be nice to be able to say, <laughs> oh, cool, my buddy who wants to play on PC, I can link up and play with him. It would, it would open up my ability to play yeah. with people a little bit more. Everyone. But- Especially if it went to Game Pass. But Even only for so. people like, that you actually know. Like, the problem is their matchmaking that's what I'm system is completely broken. You yeah. have a person over here who doesn't have a PlayStation 5, and the next Borderlands comes out. Borderlands 4, right? And it's cross-platform because Microsoft put so much money into their system to do that. Gearbox and Take-Two Interactive are interested. So it's on Game Pass. But your buddy, who doesn't want to buy a PS5, you got one, has an Xbox One, that original one, can log in and play with you now where they couldn't before or someone on PC can well, do that. Like that's amazing. Be, Borderlands 4 will be well past the Xbox one is outdated, but I get yeah, what you're saying. No, I still understand what yeah. you mean. Like, um, but all I'm saying is that matchmaking is awful, but all right. Yeah. So I think that that does it for this episode. I don't, I think we're starting to peter off into tangents. So um, I think that I do think that Xbox strategy is a long, long play. Um, I think they will. I think based on what they've put forward now, I think that enough people are reacting negatively to it and enough people are discussing it in a negative light um, that uh, is kind of missing the point of what they're doing, but it doesn't change the fact that, like, uh, I think that the, in regards to hardware sales, I think the PS5 will be king in uh, December. But, um, well, yeah, I do think that the landscape of games is changing, and I think Microsoft is employing some interesting strategies and interesting business models mm-hmm. that will probably pay dividends in the long run. But in the meantime... Um, the the current we're still operating under a current zeitgeist and uh, under that z- under that uh, paradigm uh, Sony I think has beaten them in this regard so mm-hmm. um, yeah cool. I mean this is this uh, Microsoft still has the strategy of games it's all about games and getting people to play games and as long as they don't go back to what they were trying to do with the original Xbox one where they went TV and streaming and all these other like movies and sports and packages and run your DVR through your console and it'd be like no they, they've course corrected from that they're focusing on games and Microsoft will have success. They will be successful in the next generation. What we determine as what that looks like will change. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Cool. All right. Well, that's the show. We, again, this is a bonus episode. So we uh, also release main episodes every Monday. They're a little bit cleaner, a little bit tighter and have fun segments and stuff like that too. Uh, this was a rambly long uh discussion that didn't have include any fun whatsoever so oh, no it wasn't fun at all uh, nope nope not fun at all it was a podcast about games that is just that sucks all the fun out of the room but uh anyways yeah so if you want to find our regular show termite where can the good people of the internet find our regular show and where if can you're... they interact with us about this show this episode if they have feedback on the microsoft showcase or what they're excited about with the xbox or what they're pissed off about with the xbox <laughs> hit us up <laughs> you can find us at 80bitpodsmash.com. That's our landing website where we have links to all of the po- podcasting platforms you could think of. Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Stitcher, as well as our RSS feed. You can plug it into any app you would like, 80bitpodsmash.com. You can interact with us across all the various social media outlets, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Reddit, all 80bit Podsmash. no hyphens, spaces, uppercases, none of that funny business, just straight on at us at 80 bit pod smash. Uh, we have a discord server with links on every single one of our show notes. So if you go to our 80 bit pod smash.com website, you can find a show. It doesn't matter which one you'll find a discord link, jump in, join us in discord, ha- jump in on our, our conversations that are happening live within our community. And then you can also find us on twitch.tv slash 80 bit pod smash every week on Wednesday nights at eight o'clock Eastern in the evening. We are there. One of the two of us are streaming and we are just kind of playing whatever we want and talking about the games and the developers and the pedigree and having some fun. So come join us, find us, interact with us, give us your thoughts, comments, questions, concerns, and ideas. It'd be great. And right. lastly, Apple podcasts or iTunes, go give us a review. If you give us a review, we will read it on the show. Now we're family friendly, so we may have to censor it, but it doesn't matter what it says. It doesn't matter how many stars we will read 
your reviews on our show. So please go to iTunes or Apple Podcasts and give us a review. Leave it there so that we can be discovered by people. Help us out. Yeah, there's nothing new. I just pulled it up. There's nothing new as of right okay. now. So the last one was from 2018. So come on, yep. two more, two years. We need <clears> some. Uh, we need some up to date customer reviews on the Apple Podcast. Even if you don't listen on Apple Podcasts, just log in, create a dummy account, delete it, thirty seconds, and we'll read whatever you have to say. So yep. All right. Well, that again, that's the show. Uh, ne- the the next episode that you listen to, the one that's coming out on Monday, will be about accessibility options. Uh, and obviously we just dropped an episode on caffeine and junk food this month this past Monday so if you haven't listened to that listen to that as well so yeah if you stuck with us for the entire hour and 40 minutes well then God bless your soul and uh, we will see you next week see you next week